So we had started talking about reactions, critical reactions, philosophical reactions to industrialization, mostly in Great Britain, but as we'll see also uh, in America. And I'd identified four kind of areas that these happened in, uh, morality, ethics, ontology, and aesthetics. We covered the first one, uh, the, the kind of moral criteria, whether industrialization was inherently good or bad and what effect it had on the sort of spiritual condition or the moral condition uh, of, 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 of people, of citizens, of workers especially. Um, that's a slightly fuzzy concept and, and it's one that um, is a little bit hard to pin down. I want to start this portion of the lecture by talking about one that we are very much uh, in tune with today that's come back maybe more so uh, than some of the other three, and that's the ethical critique. If the moral critique of industrialization was simply whether something is good or bad, right, good or evil, uh, whether it has a salutary effect on, on people's character or not, the ethical critique is something that uh, is, is about something that can be maybe measured a little bit more. Whether industrialization has uh, social effects in particular that are uh, right or just, whether people uh, suffer in comparison with others because of the effects of industrialization. Again, something that's very much uh, with us today. The thinker that I want to put forward as the model of the ethical critique or a, or a more kind of measurable social and economic critique uh, is William Morris. Morris was known in his lifetime mostly as a poet. Today he's probably mostly known as a textile designer. Uh, but he was a designer of all sorts of things and along with the designs that he produced had thoughts about how they were produced. So very much in line with the theme of the course, not just what the finished product was, but the consequences of how those products were, were made. Um, he had a, a fairly upper class uh, upbringing, a wealthy middle class upbringing uh, out in the countryside uh, near London. He went up, as they say, to Oxford uh, and studied classics, but he was more interested uh, in medieval studies. So the, the impact of the, the neo-Gothic was not just architectural, it was also, as we saw in painting, uh, in poetry, in literature, uh, and Morris was very much part of this uh, from, a, from a young age. He trained as an architect. He uh, was uh, in the circle of pre-Raphaelites, these painters who believed that only things that were done before the Renaissance uh, were really good and pure, and that the Renaissance and the Enlightenment had uh, had sort of corrupted painting and art and architecture. Um, and he worked with uh, a builder named Philip Webb to design uh, what was called the Red House, a country house that tried to go back to traditions uh, of medieval building. We'll take a quick look at it here in a second. A very, very conscious statement of what would come to be called arts and crafts ideals. A return to handcraft, a return to traditional forms, uh, a rejection of or resistance to industrial building, right? So no cast iron, uh, no wrought iron, uh, all traditional materials that could be worked, uh, worked by hand. Shortly after that, uh, he joined a decorative arts firm and, and eventually it became his own, Morris and Company, uh, which produced furniture, textiles, wallpapers, all of them in a kind of neo-Gothic or at least a sort of neo-medieval uh, vein. He was very much influenced by Ruskin uh, and, and by the Stones of Venice, which came out, remember, in 1851, so an influential time uh, in Morris's life. Um, but he was against what he called sham restoration or a, a, a against also Ruskin's idea of letting uh, things just go to ruin entirely uh, in favor of preservation. And he co-founded uh, an organization that is still around today, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings in 1877. And this uh, organization uh, crusaded for repair rather than reconstruction. So not building the sort of fantasy uh, reconstructions of Ville le Duc, but also not uh, so kind of uh, taken with the idea of ruins as Ruskin wanting to be good stewards basically for, for buildings that were all already there. Um, he was politically radical, uh, a, a Marxist, uh, back when Marx was uh, a fairly fresh thinker. Um, but he also, he tempered uh, what uh, come across as fairly radical politics with a real belief in a pleasure and creativity uh, and individuality. So uh, he thought that work, rather than being thought of as labor, which was sort of inherently uh, evil, um, he thought that work could be invested with pleasure, that, that a true craftsman 
would take both pride and pleasure and, and find meaning uh, in the work that they did. The sort of work that Morris didn't like was factory work, so piecework or sort of commodity work where there's no individual attention, there's no uh, sort of pride in the work, it's just simply uh, labor. And Morris contrasted this with Kraft, uh, his, his whole career. Um, 1890, he writes this uh, sort of um, uh, uh, socialist uh, fantasy called News from Nowhere, where he proposes a kind of utopian uh, community, and it's called a romantic Marxist work of, of science fiction, very much in this kind of uh, rejection of industrialization in favor of individual uh, experience and fulfillment. So no surprise, this is what the Red House looks like. It looks like a medieval uh, cottage. Uh, sort of blown up to wealthy landowner scale, um, but it's 1859 rather than being 1300 or, or 1200. And you can see traditional forms, traditional materials, the use of handmade brick uh, and hand cut shingles, uh, all things that Morris believed not only had a, a sort of salutary effect on us as in a sort of moral sense, like it's a, 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 a force for good in, in the people's lives that imbues character to the, the homeowner's lives, uh, but also an ethical good that, um, it, that the money that went into this house went mostly into craftsmen, right? Paying uh, brick makers, um, honoring their craft, giving them the, the, the kind of their, their due uh, in a way. Um, on the right, you see a typical uh, Morris and Company textile, so very elaborate, very carefully drafted, very carefully crafted, and again, paying uh, attention, but also money to the, the craftsmen who, who took the time and found the pleasure uh, in this kind of work. Um, it's worth saying that Morris and Company textiles and furniture um, were enormously expensive, right? They were sold basically to the, the wealthy landowning class. Uh, but it was sold with this kind of ethical uh, marketing uh, uh, idea that you were paying not only for the furniture, but you were paying to instantiate your values, right? What you thought uh, society uh, could or should be. Morris's company also uh, published. Uh, Morris himself was an author, better known, as I said in his day, as a poet probably than anything else. And so the the idea of this kind of handcrafted neo-medieval approach um, applied as well to their publications. And here you see two examples, a, a, a speech that he gave in 1889 that is put into uh, this very particular arts and crafts font, um, hand printed, uh, hand letter pressed, and on the right, uh, a title page of, of one of Morris's books where um, he is invested in an artist to draw the frontispiece uh, for this book. It is not just set by hand. It's actually drawn and woodcut uh, by an artist that Morris wants to support, not in terms of charity, but in terms of changing the, the sort of economics of cultural production, in this case, making a, a, a book of poems, changing the economics of it so that uh, it can help support uh, a craftsman, help uh, keep, continue the craftsman's career in which he finds uh, pleasure, in which he finds meaning. Morris and Company made uh, lots of furniture as well. So here on the left, uh, a typical uh, arts and crafts set of chairs, uh, all handmade, all with uh, local wood, with textiles done by, uh, by local craftsmen, local designers. And on the right, you see the effect. And, and we think of this as a sort of classic Victorian uh, interior today. It's worth remembering, though, that um, these are being done in an era of industrialization, when the, the Crystal Palace is out there, when mill construction is out there. And you can think of this really as a reaction, again, digging in their heels, uh, Morris in this case, arguing for uh, an ethical reason to not just sort of capitulate to the industrial uh, production, the industrial housewares that you would find, uh, but really investing instead in the process, in the, 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 crafts, uh, the craftsmen themselves. Now, he, this expands into a, a sort of theory of, uh, of architecture, a theory of beauty, and in this case, uh, a, a theory of resistance to the commercial qualities of the industrially produced uh, goods that Morris sees uh, coming out of factories. And this would apply as well, I think, to industrially produced buildings. So 
think of cast iron, think of glass, the, the kind of factory made structures that we've looked at. Morris reacts against these uh, very, very heavily. Um, and he says that when you are, in his words, applying art to articles of utility, I think that's a, a pretty good uh, definition of, of design. Um, one, to add beauty to the results of the work of man. In other words, to make things that appeal to our, our senses, to our eyesight, which would otherwise be ugly. And secondly, and importantly, no less importantly, to add pleasure to the work itself, which would otherwise be painful and disgustful. So there is a kind of utilitarian approach here where uh, Morris thinks that we ought to find the kind of culprits, right? Industrial production that um, sort of savagely saps all of the joy out of making things. We ought to eliminate that. Instead, we ought to find ways to produce that honor the, the, the craftsmen, the craftspeople, that give them the, the pleasure that they seek uh, in their work. And he contrasts um, what he calls the commercial person um, with, with what he thinks of as, as the, the kind of ethical designer. The ethics of the commercial person um, bid him give as little as he can to the public and take as much as he possibly can um, from them. The ethics of the artist uh, ask him to put as much of himself into every piece of goods uh, and to ask only the kind of you know, survival uh, rate from the, from, from the public. Uh, the commercial person, therefore, is in the position that he is dealing with a public of enemies, right? Industrialization means that the people selling and the people buying are at odds. The artist, on the contrary, uh, is, in, is dealing with a public of friends and neighbors. So there is a collaborative idea to this, a, communi a communal idea to this that extends beyond the workshop and into the, into the marketplace itself. Now, there is a, a huge range of arts and crafts architecture that, that Morris uh, and to some degree Ruskin inspire. And these typically go back and look at medieval uh, pro prototypes. Uh, they look at Gothic examples, but there are also uh, instances of thinking anew, thinking what a, a kind of modern handicraft building in particular could look like. So while Norman Shaw's houses, uh, one of which you see here in the upper left, this is a sort of classic arts and crafts uh, approach where you're looking at traditional forms in addition to traditional materials. There are other ways to think about this that feel more modern. And a great example of this is the Scottish designer, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Uh, no one may be more for his chairs, but here's an example uh, of, of Macintosh's architecture. This is the Glasgow School of Art, which is built in two phases right around the turn of the century. All handcrafted, right? The stonework is all cut by hand. The furniture is cut by hand. The glass is made by hand, but put together in a very modern way, right? A way that maybe resonates with medieval principles, but that doesn't kind of uh, imitate them, right? That, that builds on them and finds, uh, finds new ways uh, to express them. It is worth pointing out that most arts and crafts architecture was done for wealthy patrons, that it takes a lot of money to pay for the small army of craftspeople that are needed uh, for these sort of structures. Um, there is a, a very nice collection of arts and crafts houses uh, along this one stretch of the Thames River in Chelsea, and you get the sense that uh, this was a collection of very wealthy people. but wealthy people who understood that they had some leverage and that they could maybe impact, if only in a small way, uh, the, the, not only the quality of the work that was being produced in the country, but the, the quality of the production processes themselves, right? That they could help sponsor uh, hand crafting again in, in a way that would compete um, with, with industrialization. And this uh, is sort of the, the standard, you know, large homeowners uh, choice during the 1890s, 1910s, uh, that you build these arts and crafts houses, you employ a small army uh, of very good artists, very good craftspeople, and you're not only building uh, a good house, but you're doing it in a way that supports the, the craftspeople themselves, but also the whole nature of non-industrial uh, craft. The third critique I want to look at is ontological, and that's a kind of big word from philosophy, but essentially it means 
thinking about the, the, the nature of being, and we might call it uh, authenticity or uh, honest use of materials or, or something like that. Um, there are a number of people uh, who think along these lines, who worry about what happens when an industrial process allows you to make many, many, many copies of exactly the same thing. Like, what's the real thing? What's the authentic single thing? And you see this to some degree in the critiques that uh, we've seen already. Ruskin, for instance, worries about industrially produced building materials being uh, lacking moral character. I think that's a sort of ontological critique, right? What is this? Is it a real material if it comes out of a factory instead out of, out of the you know, loving attention of a, of a craftsperson? Um, but we've also seen it a bit in Ville le Duc, right? Thinking about uh, the nature of materials, what, what cast iron wants to be when it's combined with masonry. And Ville le Duc's proposals for market halls and things like that come out of trying to understand what an authentic iron architecture would be. As we've seen, that only goes so far, right? You can argue about what's authentic and what's not. Ville le Duc's take on historic preservation, for instance, is one that we think kind of goes against the idea of authenticity. There are, it turns out, many ways to, to be authentic or many ways to argue uh, for authenticity. So the, the, um, the person I want to look at, the thinker I want to look at in terms of uh, authenticity is a German uh, historian and theorist named Gottfried Semper. Um, he, too, is born into a reasonably wealthy family. Interestingly enough, German industrialists, so people very familiar with uh, factories and industrial processes. Um, he studies the, the unusual combination of history and mathematics as an undergrad, and I think if you combine that, you get maybe something like architecture, um, which he studies in, in Munich. Uh, and then he goes to Paris to work, uh, and he is there uh, during an uprising in 1830, um, which affects him, right? He sees the kind of social impact of industrialization and begins to wonder whether uh, this has all been for the good, right? Whether the, the social unrest that he's seeing is an indication that maybe industrialization is worth resisting. Um, he travels, he ends up in Dresden for, for uh, 15 or 16 years, and he is there for yet another uprising in 1849 um, he picks sides on the Republican side against the, the uh, imperial side, uh, which ends up getting him kicked out of, of Germany. And he has this very interesting uh, memory. He says, well, you know, I wasn't really an active participant. I only made one single barricade. Um, it, it was a good barricade. It held because it was practical. And he said, because it did the job, it was also beautiful. And I think this is an early, um, and it's, it's an aesthetic notion, but I think it also gets to the idea that, that function is one area Area that we find uh, authenticity within. Um, he bounces around. He uh, is a refugee in Paris. He goes to London, and he's there when the Crystal Palace opens. And it, he, the, the Crystal Palace opens as he is working on his great kind of theoretical work, a book called The Four Elements of Architecture. And he, uh, as we'll see, sees an exhibit at the Crystal Palace, not the Crystal Palace itself, but an exhibit within the Crystal Palace that he thinks contrasts with the industrial building he sees around him uh, in ways that are important. And he develops uh, a, a sort of resistant idea to industrialization that's based more on archeology span and based more on materiality and what today we would call tectonics. Um, he has a definition for style. Remember what we saw Ville le Duc's, the, the manifestation of an ideal based on a principle. Um, Semper thinks that style results from what he calls the logical and harmonious application of materials and their natural configurations. You can think about this as a search for authenticity. Again, what do materials want to be? What's the natural way to use them? What can we kind of not argue against? And um, he also believes that, that style can come about from external pressures. So function, but also he thinks cultural and historical contexts. So again, there are many places you can find authenticity. There are many places that you can argue for uh, a, a design decision being real. Some of them have to do with materials. Some of them have to do with performance. And he acknowledges that some of them have to do with historic contexts, right? So if we think about that, he agrees with Ville le Duc that, uh, that you can find authenticity in the material properties themselves. He agrees, as we'll see with Louis Sullivan, that you can find authenticity in what you're asking those materials to do. 
and he agrees with uh, Pugin, for example, that the cultural and historical context that you're building in, for instance, the legacy of the Gothic in Great Britain, can also be a, a place where you find truth, where you find authenticity. In reality, though, as we'll see, Semper is a Renaissance revivalist. He doesn't believe in the Gothic. He believes in this other tradition, classicism. Uh, and we'll see how that maybe contrasts a little bit with his philosophy. Um, but all of this is basically a search for something other than the mass-produced, machine-made nature of, of industrialized building, which he sees sort of cropping up all around him. So in 1851, he is at the Crystal Palace. He's at the London Exhibition. Um, he uh, is uh, sort of uh, horrified, as Ruskin is, maybe not horrified, but taken aback, I suppose, by the repetition, by the sameness, by the seeming sort of flimsiness, um, by what he might call the inauthenticity of, of iron and, and glass construction. And in one of the exhibits, he sees what he refers to as the Caribbean hut. And we don't know a whole lot about what he actually saw, but he draws it up. Um, and we, we've talked about the, the kind of very Eurocentric, you know, very frankly kind of racist idea of, of a primitive hut, trying to find, that is an example of trying to find authenticity in traditions, in, in going back to the roots of building and trying to establish what it is about those buildings that are, that are kind of special. Semper looks at this hut and he says that Throughout all kinds of traditions, you find that there are these four elements, and this is, this is the title of his book, The Four Elements of Architecture. And he says that the most authentic buildings are the ones that establish themselves within these types. So he says that the buildings are built around a hearth, which is made of ceramics, right? brick, the clay, stone. Um, they have uh, stereotomy or masonry pillars and walls around them. So sometimes maybe out of bamboo, but sometimes out of brick. They have walls that are more like fabric binding and covering and roofs and furniture that he calls tectonics are made out of carpentry. These four elements, he says, uh, are, are four things that are kind of elided or, or gotten rid of by mass production, by iron and steel, by glass. Um, instead, he says, we want to find buildings where the dialogues between these four elements uh, are, are kind of obvious and apparent and therefore true. And if you think back to uh, temples, for example, or early settlements, uh, or some of the mosques that, that we looked at, um, you find that this, you can sort of massage these ideas uh, to, to make a lot of early buildings, a lot of ancient buildings fit into this kind of schema. Um, Semper here is interestingly saying that there is authenticity both in the materials. You know, notice that he's talking about wood or ceramics or masonry or fabric. But he's also talking about the, the ends that those materials are deployed to, right? So fabrics uh, get used for walls, right? Ceramics get used for the hearth, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the appropriate application of those materials to the problems that we're solving that he thinks constitutes authenticity, right? That, that he thinks are, constitutes kind of truth in architecture. Um, okay, so his actual work uh, doesn't maybe reflect this so much. He is, uh, his style is very much this kind of ultra lush classicism. Um, he has a, a, a very successful career. He does buildings uh, in particular in Dresden, um, but they seem to kind of go against this idea of uh, authentic or, or um, uh, as, as he would say, like, you know, the search for beginnings, right? The essences uh, of architecture. There's an interesting parallel to Semper's thought that takes place in uh, American uh, philosophy and American construction. Uh, there is a, a, a school of philosophy called transcendentalism uh, that believes in the inherent goodness of the individual, very American philosophy. Um, and that believes that the individual is basically corrupted by the social institutions that spring up uh, around us. And this is kind of the inspiration for uh, ideas about building, ideas about an American architecture, an architecture of democracy, an architecture of liberty of the individual. And this comes about through a couple of uh, familiar names. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson is one of the best known of the transcendentalists. And he writes about architecture not as an architect, he was never trained as one, um, but as a sort of uh, distant observer. And he actually gets an awful lot right. 
uh, he has this this very good quote that says, um, you know, the architecture architects really only have these narrow limits that we can express our creativity in. Uh, gravity, wind, sun, rain, the size of men and animals and such like have more to say than the architect does. We are problem solvers and it's only after we have taken care of all of those elements, figured out how to put materials around spaces and stack things up. It's only after we solve all those problems that we can express ourselves. And he says that there is a kind of uh, almost like a, a, a biological imperative to design. Um, th there's a, a, an interesting parallel here, I think, with Darcy Thompson when Emerson says, Emerson says, nature who made the mason made the house. In other words, when we are building, it's not that we are building things that are man-made. Those are natural because we are natural. And therefore, we are, have to be in conformance with the same laws of physics, the same laws of efficiency, uh, as the natural examples that, that Darcy Thompson would have shown. But there's also in here uh, a, a sense of, of morality, right? That there is a, a kind of greater good that these authentic buildings can be sort of uh, steered to. Um, the most perfect form to answer an end is so far beautiful. And what Emerson means by this is that when we find the most uh, efficient, eloquent solution, uh, this touches our, 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 our emotions, right? This touches our soul in addition to satisfying our, our mind. So we feel in seeing a noble building, which rhymes well as we do in hearing a perfect song, that it is spiritually organic, right? So this is a, a very much uh, a kind of moral uh, issue as well. That is had a necessity in nature um, for, for being was one of the possible forms in the divine mind that is now only discovered and executed by the artist. This goes back all the way to, uh, you know, Gothic uh, medieval theology, right? That there are perfect forms out there uh, that, that, that we can aspire to. But th this idea that the perfectly solved problem is going to touch our soul or is going to have some kind of greater impact than just solving the problem relates, I think, to this resistance to industrialization, right? All around Emerson is the idea that factory production, that uh, scientific applications of, uh, of scientific principles, uh, good engineering is going to just naturally solve all our problems, right? That optimization is going to make, um, make our way in the world. And Emerson points out that that's not entirely true, right? There are solutions that uh, can satisfy our needs, but they don't necessarily touch our souls, right, or satisfy our souls. Um, he does not believe that simply picking up uh, Gothic examples, or in Semper's case, classical examples, um, is adequate. Uh, the, the idea that, that society is uh, corrupting, that it's profane, that it degrades us, means that we can't look to other social examples or cultural examples. We have to actually go out and find the authentic. We have to find the real on our own. And you get this, uh, these, these uh, thoughts that, uh, that presage minimalism, right? That we have to cut away till we come to the solid ground of real, not fancied requirement. Um, get, get rid of everything that is not, uh, not necessary. Uh, and that the design really becomes a process of editing down, of taking out uh, all of the excess until we get to something that is, as Emerson would say, authentic uh, or real. Henry David Thoreau, uh, maybe better known uh, than Emerson, uh, who, who wrote the book uh, Walden, um, talks about architecture in similar ways. Thoreau, of course, goes out into the woods to, to, to sort of find uh, truth, to find himself. And he talks a lot about the house that, that he builds there, or actually that he has help uh, getting built uh, for him. And he talks about, he, con he contrasts that house with the architecture that he sees in big cities in particular. And like Emerson, uh, Thoreau thinks that the city, especially the industrialized city, uh, is profane. He comes out against the architecture that he sees in New York, a vulgar adornment of what is vulgar. So this, you know, the developing kind of um, classicism that he sees in uh, very, very early sort of tall buildings, but also in the, the cast iron buildings that we looked at uh, as well. Um, and, and he parallels Ruskin's critique of the Crystal Palace, right? It's not enough to be the biggest. Um, you have to be the, the, the most thoughtful uh, as well. There's also a parallel with Morris, and this last line is not the builder of more consequence than the material. So thinking about the impact that 
uh, industrialized or commodified building has on the, on the people building it uh, as well. Acknowledges that there are great, more efficient uh, materials out there, iron in particular, um, but thinks that these materials are helping to cut us off from both nature, but also from, again, authentic experience. Uh, that that the, the best buildings for us uh, are the ones that are stripped as our lives must be stripped um, so that, uh, so that we, we uh, get rid of all of the stuff that is fake. All we're left with is, is the stuff that is, that is real. He thinks, of course, that we are at our best in nature. We need architecture around us to keep us warm or, or to, to protect us. Um, but, but that our natural, most authentic self is out there in nature, quote, where there is no house uh, and, and no housekeeper. He comes at, at uh, architecture the exact opposite direction from Ruskin, right? Um, Thoreau's idea is that you consider first how slight a shelter is absolutely necessary. That is the best shelter. Ruskin, on the other hand, believes that the definition of architecture uh, is that the, um, the, there are uh, architecture adds beauty to what would otherwise be just too simple to think about, right? So Thoreau thinks there is beauty within the simple solution itself. Ruskin thinks that beauty comes when we adequately ornament uh, or detail uh, that solution. And reconstructed, uh, but, but here uh, is, uh, is, is Thoreau's house. And of course, there's, it's interesting to look at this in the context of Zemper, right? There is a hearth, there is a floor, there are walls that maybe aren't as, uh, as, as much like fabric as the, the, the hut that Semper was talking about, but nevertheless, right, the, this house is elemental. It only has the pieces that it absolutely needs uh, to, to, to function. How we uh, perceive uh, the, um, the, the, this, this sense of authenticity begins to nudge over into aesthetics. And this is the fourth place where we find that the resistance to industrialization. Aesthetics for a whole range of philosophers and theorists is about the kind of human experience, right? What we find beautiful. And the, the beautiful is definitely a place where we can find resistance to industrialization, right? Resistance to commodification by focusing on our own sensual pleasure, right? By, by the, the, the pleasure that we get from seeing things uh, that, that we find beautiful. Um, he is against any sort of historic revivalism. Um, he, like Emerson, believes that uh, beauty has to come from within. That it can't simply be slapped on uh, or imitated. And he has uh, what he calls a theory of structure, which is really kind of a, a theory of design, which talks very much about not only the, um, the, 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 the uh, efficiency that we require of our designers, but also the, the kind of impact, right? The, the, the way that, that, that that's gonna be uh, perceived. So a scientific arrangement of spaces and forms to functions and to site. That sounds very familiar to, to studio students today. An emphasis of teachers proportions to their graduated importance and function. So punctuating or detailing or designing them so that we can read the solution into the building. Um, color and ornament to be decided and arranged and varied by strictly organic laws. So organic meaning there is a consistency between the, the overall solution uh, and the details, having a distinct reason for each uh, decision, and he says the entire and immediate banishment, like Thoreau would say, of all makeshift and make-believe. So hewing to only what is real, only what is true, only what is authentic. We can argue about that, but having that as, as your kind of North Star is, as you're a designer. Um, he uh, has a couple of metaphors, just like Ville Le Duc. He says that um, the, the organic metaphor is one. We look at the, the kind of efficiency that nature comes up with. This again, he's writing um, before, but uh, in the same kind of era as, as Darwin. So there is an idea of looking to nature for, for scientific principles. Um, and the machine, right? Looking at the engineering of a, of a steamship in particular, uh, as, as a model for this kind of um, very, very rigorous approach, right? Trying to find the, the authentic, the real um, uh, uh, function that's at the core of the design problem, doing nothing other than that, and then expressing it uh, in a way that makes it apparent. <clears throat> 
Architecturally, I think you can look at um, some of the, the practitioners of the day, in particular, someone like H.H. H. Richardson of Boston, uh, architect who specialized uh, in, in large part in libraries, uh, but also in churches, uh, and see this, uh, this effect, right? This idea that we're going to strip our building down uh, to its functional elements, uh, and then find ways to make those functional elements speak not about a kind of metaphorical relationship to classicism or gothic or a, 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 a sort of um, stage set uh, idea, but instead speaking the, the function clearly and finding a language uh, to do that within. So here, for example, is a library in Quincy, Massachusetts that Richardson did uh, toward the end of his uh, career. Today, we look at this and say, well, this is you know, Richardsonian Romanesque, right? There's definitely a, a kind of uh, architectural style applied to it. But if we look at the plan, right, we see that Richardson's plan is very, very simple, right? Very, very stripped down. Um, like Ville le Duc, he has taken the, the pieces that the library needs. So an entry hall, uh, the, the stacks and a reading room, uh, a stair to get up to the, to the stacks, a vestibule to keep the cold air out. And he has laid those out in what he sees as the most scientifically uh, appropriate way, right? The most efficient way. Um, when he has then both made spaces out of those and made an object out of it, the expression, the forms, but also the detailing is in his view designed to basically tell you how the building is operating. So you can see the, the, uh, the sort of uh, clear story windows on the left. Um, that is, those are windows that are above the library stacks, bringing in daylight, but letting you read the height of the stacks against them. You can see the return of the staircase in the turret that's, that sits next to the, um, to the entrance. And in the reading room, you can see the floor to ceiling windows uh, that explain to you that daylight is going to flood into, into that space. So yes, there are certainly stylistic, what we today call stylistic choices, but they are all in the service of making the building arrangement, building function uh, clear. Um, Richardson's maybe best known work, uh, the, the uh, Trinity Church in Boston, uh, is similarly designed, right? All of the pieces are there to show you what's going on uh, inside. So while there is Romanesque ornament kind of applied to it, in Richardson's view, these are simply ways of, of detailing the solution to the problem. And the solution, the massing of the building especially, uh, is what you read when you, when you look at that, uh, that church even today. The aesthetic critique is probably most uh, profoundly put forward by Louis Sullivan, uh, who is the kind of American uh, father figure of organic uh, expression, right? The, the uh, organic architecture that Frank Lloyd Wright will pick up uh, and, and run with in the 20th century. And he uh, has a very, very uh, similar uh, take on kind of optimized construction that Ruskin did when looking at the Crystal Palace. So here from this very famous essay that he writes, The Tall Building Artistically Considered, um, he goes through the design of a skyscraper, right? And he lays out, you know, here's how you put all the pieces together. Um, and once you put all the pieces together, once you solve the problem, uh, all in evidence, he says, is materialistic. An exhibition of force, resolution of brains, intellectual uh, design, optimized design, in the keen sharp sense of the world, this is the joint product of the speculator, the engineer, the building. How, he says, do we impart to this sterile pile, right, this meaningless pile of, of solutions, um, the graciousness of those higher forms of sensibility uh, and culture that rest on the lower and fiercer passions. So there is a, a moral quality to this, but for Louis Sullivan, it comes about in the way that that that, that the solution is uh, expressed, right? The way that um, the building becomes an organic whole and speaks to us about the way that it solves the problem, about the way that it is is put together. Um, and for Sullivan, he says that the the, the character of a, of a tall building is that it is lofty, it is tall. And therefore, uh, as we are trying to make it into something that speaks to our uh, emotions, that speaks to our soul, uh, it is that kind of verticality, right? That upward thrust uh, 
um, that, that we want uh, the, 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 the skyscraper to express, right? We want a skyscraper to um, be uh, it, it, both tall in reality, but also to express the idea of, of tallness. And this is what he means by this famous phrase, form follows function, right? It's not that we're just solving the problem. It's that the form follows the function, that we get the function right, and then we think about how to make that into a, a, a form, maybe a capital F form, right? Something that has an idea behind it, that has a consistency, uh, that, that, that really, really speaks to us. And the, the buildings that are often kind of uh, shown as examples of this, the Wainwright, for instance, in St. Louis, Sullivan says, look, you know, the office building is just a bunch of floors just a bunch of office cells, just a bunch of windows stacked on top of one another. Um, so long as we solve that problem efficiently enough, uh, our clients have to give us room to punctuate it, to detail it, uh, to turn it into something that speaks. And the Wainwright in particular, with its very famous uh, cornice at the top, the very, very delicate proportions of the, uh, the columns and the spandrels, the layering of column spandrel window that we saw in the, in the Chicago uh, buildings of the 1880s and 1890s. Um, this you know, very robust pair of ground floors that sets the rest of the building off on a plinth. All of this, Sullivan says, is talking about uh, the expression of the tall building, right? Making uh, an organic whole out of this agglomeration uh, of parts. And this really is, is what we've come to understand as organic architecture, right? Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, who works in Sullivan's office, who talks about him as the father figure, the Liebermeister, um, he hews very closely to this idea of, of the organic uh, principle. In 1901, he writes an essay uh, called The Art and Craft of the Machine that shows, I think, that he was looking at these movements in Great Britain and thinking about how to translate them into uh, American buildings. So Wright, I think, is taking a lot of the resistant ideas from uh, Ruskin, even from Pugin. He's taking some of the ideas about honoring craftsmen from William Morris. And he's certainly taking the, the quest for authenticity that you see in Semper uh, and Greeno and combining them with this need for aesthetic expression that he gets from, uh, from Sullivan. Um, the art and craft of the machine, you can see that he's talking about uh, both uh, honoring the artist, right? The artist is emancipated to work his will with irrational freedom. So you, you give them the basic parameters and let them kind of run with it. But you do that um, with, an, uh, with an overall idea uh, that, that, the, that the, each of the artistic expressions is kind of um, working toward, right? So a, a, an organic whole that still honors the, the individual craftsmen uh, working on it. In his houses, I think you see this, the Winslow house in particular, where uh, the, the, the craft that goes into terracotta, that goes into woodwork, that goes into stone cutting, is all honored not by asking them to kind of um, repeat forms from Gothic or classical construction, but instead trying to find authenticity within that the craft itself, right? Making the craft influence the, the house. The layout you can see, I think, is based very much on, um, on, on Richardson, it, it, through Sullivan maybe, but this idea that each piece has its own expression, this gets more and more as right gets older and older, but you can see on the back of the Winslow house how there is even that uh, returning stare that he expresses in a similar way that, that Richardson does, showing you on the back elevation anyway where the, the staircase is. This, when he uh, gets a, a large industrial building, um, Wright sort of turns things around and, and, and says that even in a, a kind of a building that is all about production, the Larkin building is the headquarters for a soap manufacturer. It's full of secretaries and, cl and clerks filling out orders, right? Doing paperwork, a sort of office industrial complex. Um, but, but Wright feels the need to imbue this building with all of the, the kind of aesthetic expression that he gets from Sullivan. So he is showing you all of the various pieces, all of the stair shafts. There are mechanical shafts here that bring air into the building. He is honoring the craftsman. This is a, a building that allows the brick to speak very plainly. So showing off what the, what the Masons have been able to do, uh, using terracotta that is crafted 
uh, in workshops, and then admittedly industrially produced, but industrially produced to the, the designs of, of, of craftsmen. And then on the interior too, like honoring the, the people who are working there, trying to make a decent environment inside with a great big central atrium uh, that, that brings daylight into it. A building, ironically enough, that is an industrial building, right, for an industrial concern, but that is done with a, a, a real care about what it means to, to not get swept up as, a, as an individual human being in either industrial production or in this case in the administration of it. And maybe the, the most uh, interesting parallel to this is, is one of his most famous works, Unity Temple, uh, just outside Chicago, where he uses a brand new material, concrete, reinforced concrete, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in the next lecture. Um, but he uses it in a way that you can tell that he is searching for an appropriate aesthetic expression. What is the authentic nature of concrete? This is a question that, as we'll see, has no real easy answer. And how do we ornament, punctuate, decorate a concrete building in ways that respect the craftsman uh, that, that, that Wright has worked with before? So lots of wood trim, lots of interesting formwork that requires delicate uh, carpentry. And how do we make it into a building that is uh, authentic, not in his case by looking back to Gothic precedent or classic precedent, although I'd argue there's plenty of classic precedent uh, in, in Unity Temple, but instead that tries to find uh, something authentic in American traditions, in uh, uh, American construction, and in the experience of the, the parishioners who show up uh, to, to Unity Church uh, every Sunday. What is it about their experience uh, that can lend authenticity? We'll look in the last piece of the lecture, we'll look at where all of this goes. We'll look at what happens when arts and crafts ideals meet the kind of overwhelming influence of industrial uh, production and get either co-opted by, uh, by industrial uh, design or, looking at it the other way, have a, a profound influence that makes design uh, continue to ask some of these questions uh, even today.